So what even is a sixth generation fighter? After China unveiled its newest aircraft in development last week, there's been a great deal of discussion online about sixth generation fighters and just how much better they'll be than fifth generation platforms like today's F-22 Raptor and F-35 Lightning II. But the truth is, Fighter generational designations are sort of more marketing malarkey than they are technical classifications. And that may even be more true of sixth generation fighters today than any past generation. Fighter generational designations haven't actually been around for all that long. They really first started to catch on in the early to mid 1990s thanks to two different groups of people. The first were historians like Richard Hallion who were looking backward and trying to classify different eras of specifically jet-powered fighters. And that is an important distinction to make. Prop-driven fighters like the P-51 Mustang or Supermarine Spitfire don't exist within this generational classification. Or maybe you might call them Generation Zero fighters. But the first generation of fighters, according to these generational designations, were the first to be powered by turbojet propulsion. Platforms like the ME-262 or the P-80. But by the 1990s, those historians were joined by another group who were also interested in these generational designations. And that group was mostly the US Air Force and Lockheed Martin, who were actively developing and fielding a new fighter that was so much more capable than even the best jets in service at the time, that they needed to find some way to convey this generational leap and capability. And thus, the F-22 Raptor emerged as the world's first fifth generation fighter. And in a real way, stealth fighters like the F-22 helped bring these generational designations into the common nomenclature. But once that happened, the meanings behind these generational designations got murkier than ever, because there is no overarching governing body that decides exactly what technologies are required for each of these generational designations. And as such, each organization, each company, each nation can even use their own criteria. In fact, China doesn't even recognize the generations in the same way that we do. And they see stealth fighters like their J-20 or America's F-30 as fourth generation instead, basically because they just chose a different starting point. And even today, the requirements to be considered a fifth generation fighter are still subject to some debate. The most commonly accepted criteria to be a fifth generation fighter include a design that prioritizes stealth from the onset, rather than making changes to improve stealth later on down the road. They also require a high degree of sensor fusion, or the ability to collect information from sensors internal to the aircraft and external from other airborne or surface-based sensors and fuse it all into a single easy-to-consume feed. But early on, there were other requirements, things like the ability to supercruise or maintain supersonic speeds without the use of the afterburner. But then the F-35 emerged as the most technologically advanced fighter on the planet, but lacking in the ability to supercruise. And for a time, some people even argued that that meant the F-35, again, the most advanced jet in service in the world, didn't meet the criteria for the fifth generation. But ultimately, the criteria just sort of shifted to match the aircraft in service. And that sort of confusion only gets worse the closer to the cutting edge you get, with today's sixth generation fighters really having no generally accepted criteria with the exception of maybe lacking and standing vertical tail surfaces, which could also be considered all aspect stealth. Now the idea behind getting rid of those standing vertical tail surfaces is really twofold. The first, it makes the aircraft even less detectable against low frequency early warning radar arrays that couldn't target a stealth fighter but could tip air defenders off that there's a stealth fighter in the area. And the second is reducing the aircraft's radar cross-section from other angles of observation aside from head-on, as stealth fighter designs usually prioritize. By getting rid of those standing vertical tail surfaces, these new fighters would be much more difficult to detect and to target from the side, for instance. 
And based on the way the media has responded to China's latest aircraft and testing, it sort of seems like people have decided that's the only requirement for a sixth generation fighter, despite the fact that Europe's Tempest is touted as a sixth generation aircraft, but you could argue that it has YF-23 style standing vertical tail surfaces. So what else could we use to determine an aircraft is truly sixth generation? Well, the next most commonly accepted criteria is the ability to control and operate AI-enabled drone wingmen. In other words, the aircraft has to have the requisite systems on board to give directives to these AI-enabled wingmen for them to go on and execute, which may come in the form of a touchscreen display in the cockpit, or if Lockheed Martin has their way, voice control systems that you can use over the radio. But even that capability is expected to be fielded first and the fifth generation F-35, so it alone would not constitute being considered a sixth generation aircraft. And there are other technologies that could find their way into this list of sixth gen requirements. One technology I think has a solid shot at making the cut is adaptive cycle engines. This is sort of like VTEC for tactical turbofans. These engines function in different operational modes, with a high fuel efficiency, low thrust mode that's good for maximizing the amount of range the amount of loiter time you can get out of the fuel you carry on board, and then a high thrust, low fuel efficiency mode to maximize power output when you need it most. And this is one area where the United States has a commanding lead, thanks to GE's XA100 and Pratt & Whitney's XA101, both adaptive cycle turbofan engines that have already demonstrated double-digit improvements in both thrust output and fuel efficiency over previous advanced engines like the F-35's Pratt & Whitney F-135 turbofan. Another possibility is truly open system software architecture. Previous fighter designs, up to and including fifth generation jets like the F-22, have really had their software and hardware married to one another. So if you want to make a significant update to the software on board, you need to swap out physical components. That adds a lot of time, complexity, and cost to upgrades. But open system software architecture not only makes it easier and cheaper to field these upgrades, but it also allows for other firms to step in and pick up where the original firm left off, allowing for more competitive contracting. And some real science fiction fans even argue that sixth generation fighters should be capable of suborbital flight. But I'll be honest, I wouldn't hold my breath on that one. So, what is a sixth generation fighter? Well, the real answer is just about anything you want to call a sixth generation fighter could be because there is no official definition. In fact, Northrop Grumman is even calling their B 21 Raider, which is a heavy payload strategic bomber, the world's first sixth generation aircraft. And lots of people online are calling China's new aircraft and testing a sixth generation fighter as well, even though all we really know about it right now is that it doesn't have any standing vertical tails. At the end of the day, these terms are really meant to be more of a shorthand that allows you to quickly know what era a tactical aircraft was fielded in, not really to assess who has the best air force. Because no matter how good a dozen and sixth generation fighters are, a hundred fourth generation fighters would still beat them. Heck, a hundred third generation fighters might. There are just so many variables to consider when comparing military power and military technology that fighter generational designations should be seen as one tool among many, rather than the only thing that matters. And if you ask me, we won't really know what a sixth generation fighter is until two or three of them are already in service. Then we can look at the capabilities that set them apart from fifth generation aircraft. Take that list and find the commonalities among all of the airframes in service, and we can use that list to form a general consensus.